It's been 50 years since Idi Amin led the military coup in Uganda that overthrew them President Milton Obote. Both occupy bloody regimes in the history of a nation whose efforts at democracy remain tentative to this day. With us now for more in Kampala, Uganda, Gerald Berebe, assistant professor of political science at York University and former reporter at the Daily Monitor, Uganda's largest independent newspaper. In Ann Arbor, Michigan, Derek Peterson, professor of African history at the University of Michigan and a winner of the Genius Fellowship from the MacArthur Foundation. He is also the author of the upcoming book, The Unseen Archive of Idi Amin, Photographs from the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation. And in Wellington, in Prince Edward County, Ontario, Rita Abrahamson, professor in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa, where she is also director of the Center for International Policy Studies. Hello, welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you all for being here for this timely Thank discussion. Um, so before we start our conversation, I'm going to show a short clip uh, that aired prior to the election. Sheldon, please roll. We need this election in peace, as we Ugandans. Hmm? We need this, this election to be in peace, must we? We want peace, first of all. And we need this election, ethical commission, to show that elections just go smooth and nice. The Uganda election took place in January, and peace was uh, something that we heard about the election. And here's an excerpt from The Observer. Shortly after President Yori Museveni, who has been in power for 35 years, won in a landslide. President Museveni scored 100% at 348 polling stations in the Kirihura, Kazo, and Isingiro districts, according to analysis of presidential election data released by the Electoral Commission. Uh, Gerald, I want to start with you, being you're the furthest away and you're in Kampala on the ground. Uh, President Museveni has said that this is, and I quote, the most cheating free election since 1962. How have the results of him winning the election been received by Ugandans? Thank you very much for having me on now. Um, so many Ugandans um, expected the elections not to be free and fair. And they were worried, of course, um, uh, for their security, uh, for their safety uh, in the in the post-election period. Part of it is because um, the president has um, cultivated this image of um, someone who can guarantee security and peace after uh, Uganda, of course, went through a period of uh, social economic corrupts and civil war uh, that took place in 1986 and, uh, of course, with the overthrow of Idi Amin and the military Obote government. Now, since uh, the voting took place, of course, voting was uh, marred by widespread uh, cases of voter fraud, ballot box stuffing. But since President Museveni was declared winner, we have witnessed mass arrest of opposition supporters. Uh, there has been a um, high level of repression that probably never seen before in Uganda since the Idi Amin um, uh, period. Part of it is because the election was highly contested. The opposition rejected the outcome. Uh, there were widespread cases of, of voter fraud and ballot box staffing that the, and falsification of results that the, the opposition said they could not accept the outcome of such a, an electoral process. So what we saw after the voting was the deployment of the military and the police throughout Kampara and all other major towns in order to contain any possible uh, cases of protest against the outcome of the election. Uh, we should mention that the opposition, um, he, he's been called probably Museveni's most formidable opposition to date, and that's Robert Chagulani, also known as Bobby Wine. And this year, it was, you know, having um, an election during a pandemic, uh, COVID protocols were used to explain a lot of the uh, rules that are around the election. Um, what do you think, how would you describe the current mood on the ground in Uganda? So the, the 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 challenge that the opposition had in this election was was that 
um, th they have no access to mass media because many of the media is controlled by the by this by the government and when the government uh, introduced this COVID-19 protocol and said there will not be mass rallies or campaigns and that they have to be uh, done through uh, internet or online platform or radio or television, it became very difficult for the opposition to access some of these platforms because many of them, like I said, they are controlled by the government. So it became a very big challenge. But on the other hand, the... the the government or the ruling party was able to exploit this COVID-19 and allowed the president to move all over the country to address um, uh, people via uh, radio station and television and all his addresses were um, covered by every uh, television and radio station all over the country. So the ground was, of course, tilted against the opposition in the first place. Do you find that they, there is a bit of a generational divide as who supports Bobby Wine and who supports President Museveni? Yes, so um, over 70% of Ugandans are below the age of 30. And Bob Wine, being this very young, energetic, and popular musician, he has been able to become, uh, to become an inspiration to many youth. Like the participation of youth in this election has been very, very high. Part of it is because the way Bob Wine carried out his campaign really appealing to the youth and the country being that it's one of the youngest countries in the world, the youth was able uh, to take up this Bob Wine's uh, uh, message and participated in the election. Now, the challenge that President M7 has is that his ruling party is full of people who are all over the age of 70. And facing a candidate in Bobo Wine, who is almost a half of President Museveni's age, became a very big ch challenge. And I think going forward, that is the challenge that the ruling party faces. The country is extremely very young. The youth face a lot of problems like unemployment, lack of jobs, um, poor, poor service delivery, access to education. But these are the things that the ruling party has failed to provide. And Bobo Wine has been able to highlight some of these uh, problems that face the youth in Uganda and showing them that the ruling party for 35 years has failed to meet the challenges of the youth. And of course, uh, Museveni has been in power for 35 years and he's been able to be in power for this long because the constitution has been changed a couple of times. How many times has the constitution been changed in Uganda? Yes, so um, you see, President Yoweri um, Museveni has been able to position himself in a way that allows him um, to rule the country using all different tactical, whether tactics, whether repression or whether uh, strategic. Now, the change of the constitution, first of all, happened in 2005 when the age limit clause, the clause that uh, limited the president. Rather, when the term limit, the uh, clause was removed. Again, it was changed six years ago to remove the clause that barred anyone above the age of 75 from participating in an election as the head of um, state. Now, all these clauses were removed in order to favor President Museven to run for another term in office. Now, as a result, Uganda now is in a state of uncertainty where President Museveni is able to rule the country until his death, <laughs> because he's now over the age of 75, and he's, he has just won a term that is going to allow him to rule the country until the age of 80. And given his insatiable appetite for power, he's likely to run again in the next elections of which would allow him to rule the country until he's 85 or above. So this explained that because all the avenues, all the democratic avenues to bar uh, President Museveni from running again, be in the constitution, have been removed in order to cater the interest of one person, President Yoweri Museveni, to rule the country as long as he wishes. And he has been able to achieve this using the majority in the parliament because his party 
has been in control of the parliament and he has been giving money to members of parliament for each clause. Members of parliament receive millions of Ugandan shillings as a bribe in order for them to change the constitution. Um, Rita, uh, when you look at this election, why would you say that this election is particularly significant? Well, in light of what Gerald said, that's, that's a good question in the sense that elections in Uganda have long been a foregone conclusion and, and this election was no different. Nobody expected a free and fair election. Nobody expected Museveni and the ruling party to lose. But elections still matter. They do kind of bestow a very thin veneer of legitimacy on the regime. And I think there are several things that were important about this election. But to start, and, and Gerald again has hinted at this, is the phenomenal rise of Bobby Wine and the way in which Wine managed to mobilize the energy of the youth. And really it signaled that moving forward, there is no way one can rule Uganda without incorporating this massive youthful population. Um, and, and that population have so far been excluded from politics, excluded from uh, the day-to-day -day running of the country. And, and, and this was a really, really important change and signal to Museveni and the regime moving forward. The, the other thing I think it's important to highlight about this election is that it really illustrated the extent to which this regime is willing to turn to authoritarian means to keep their grip on power. I mean, violence, oppression, intimidation have been a feature of pretty much all multi-party elections in Uganda. But the violence, the intimidation this time was unprecedented. And I think this illustrates to Ugandans and to Uganda's supporters abroad that Museveni will do pretty much anything to keep his grip on power. And that calls into question a whole lot of the donor assistance that uh, that Uganda has been relying upon to a significant degree. And it shows that this is not really a democracy. We may be looking at uh, an authoritarian regime with elections, but we're not looking at a democracy. I think people who support Museveni would say, and this is something that President Museveni has also said, uh, he's accused foreign agents of interfering in what's going on in Uganda. How much uh, is that, how true is that? I don't think there's much truth to that. Uh, I mean, this has been a tactic of Museveni for very long. This is how he seeks to delegitimize his opponents by saying they are agents or stooges of foreign governments. And if it had been up to the international community, then Idi Amin would still have been in power and so forth. Uh, there's, there's little doubt that uh, opposition politicians like uh, Bobby Wine has a fair degree of support and enthusiasm in the international national community, but uh, they also have significant support and enthusiasm at home, particularly among the young urban electorate. Uh, but, but this is not to say, and, and I think this is very important to underline, it is not as if the international community, whoever they support, be it Museveni or the opposition, they cannot bring about democracy in Uganda. Democracy in Uganda can, can really only come from at home from the domestic electorate. It cannot come from abroad by being imposed in any way like that. Um, I'd like to read a quote from Ugandan member of parliament, Ibrahim Samuju Nganda, that was shared on Twitter recently. Uh, he tweeted, the difference between the Amin regime and the Museveni regime is that the Museveni regime has educated people who can explain away murders. Otherwise, the crimes that Amin committed, this regime has committed. Derek, how would you respond to people who compare Idi Amin's military dictatorship 50 years ago with Museveni's presidency today? That kind of a claim has a lot of currency today in Uganda, as you might expect, especially on Twitter and to some extent in other media as well. Um, and it's certainly rhetorically powerful. Comparing President Museveni to Idi Amin is useful in helping to generate outrage and to help highlight the stakes in Museveni's government. Beyond its use as a rhetorical tool, though, I'm not entirely confident that comparing Mus President Museveni with President Amin is that helpful. Um, for one thing, it's worth saying that while President Museveni's um, government is increasingly authoritarian, 
President Demi never held elections at all. From 19, from the late 60s, in fact, political parties were banned in Uganda. And when President Demi came to power in January 1971, he carried forward this older um, policy against having political parties actively engaged in, in public life. So the first election that was held from 1962, the first national election held from 62 forward occurred in, in 1980 in December after Idi Amin's regime fell. So one thing to say is that you know the Museveni government is set up differently than the Amin government is set up. The Amin government was a military dictatorship. Politics happened by decree. Everything was done from Kampala and handed down to the provinces in a very one-way manner. President Museveni's regime works differently. I, I take the point that you know the increasing violence in public life makes reminds people of aspects of the 1970s. But nonetheless, President Museveni's regime is more answerable to the public will. Uh, considerably more answerable to the public will than Amin's had been. For Amin, uh, the military itself held the answers, and it was up to government to implement the president's directives and for administrators in the provinces to follow the line that, that Amin gave. That's that's the way that politics works in the 70s. So as a historian, why then does uh, President Museveni hold elections? Well, part of it's to do with the issues that um, that Rita Abraham mentioned a few minutes ago. That is the um, lending a kind of veneer of authenticity, as she put it, to politics. Elections have a long history in Uganda, as Rita points out. Uh, they've often been foreordained, but nonetheless, they have been from the beginning occasions for the creation of something like a national consensus. So, the first national elections in Uganda were held in 1961. They were deeply contested. A large part of Uganda's people boycotted the elections because they didn't agree that the election itself could be legitimate, that majority rule itself was thought to be illegitimate by a significant proportion of Uganda's people. The biggest national elections in Uganda's history were held in 1962 at the time of independence. Again, deeply contested, resulted in the first uh, prime ministership of Milton Obote, who came to power shortly after at the time of independence. Museveni holds elections today because he's carrying on a long tradition of electoral organizing. It's a way, as colleagues who are anthropologists point out, of generating an impression, a kind of consolidating political loyalty. Even if the votes are not accurately counted entirely, nonetheless, elections have an important purpose in helping government and it's the people to whom it's accountable enter into something like a bargain with each other. That's the important thing here. And Gerald, I want to bring you back in this. Um, in spite of all the allegations against him, President uh, Museveni is still seen by many as a fathery figure. There's the nickname Sevo, and he's also been fondly called Jaja, which means grandfather. Um, why is this the case? Well, um, <laughs> The, the people who support Museveni, and I think we should do, we should also admit that, yes, Museveni remains very popular, especially in rural areas of Uganda, where he based his rebellion uh, to fight his way into power. So he's still very, very popular among the elderly, especially people who are maybe above uh, 50 years. Now, they look at him as the father figure. They call him uh, Musei, which is a very... Uh, um, form of respect for elderly. His his wife is called Mama all over the country, among those kind of segment um, of the population. But the, the, part of the reason is because he, if you compare Museveni and Idi Amin, I would say the biggest difference is that whereas Idi Amin was a complete <laughs> authoritarian or maybe dictator, Museveni is a dictator dressed in democratic clothes, right? So he he has created institutions of the state, which Idi Amin did not have. But he has worked tirelessly to undermine these same institutions to ensure that no institutions uh, gets power to become independent and hold him accountable. So this is the biggest difference between Amin's regime and Museveni's regime. The other difference is that whereas Idi Amin did many of the human rights violations in secret, many of the people that were killed or murdered under Idi Amin, we never came to know about them until later. The, the military in Uganda right now is willing to engage in this 
torture, in abduction, in kidnapping of Ugandans, and in most cases doing them during the uh, during the day and uh, sometimes being recorded by even civilian. Many of these video clips of torture or abductions have been spreading uh, all over internet. Part of it is because they are being recorded by individual civilian. Now, we should also um, admit that, yes, Museven has created this image of himself as the father of the nation, of Uganda as a nation. Part of it is because he is such a big dominating figure in Ugandan politics, having uh, captured power as a rebel leader and having spent 35 years in power creating a huge patronage network that is able to preside over to rule the country. Well, uh, Rita and Gerald, I'd like to read an excerpt from this piece from the Global Mail that you recently co-wrote. Um, you write, this oppressive regime is bankrolled by international donors. The U.S. provides nearly $1 billion a year and another billion dollars flows from other countries, including Canada and international institutions. The U.S. has trained more troops from Uganda than from any other country in sub-Saharan Africa except Burundi. Rita, what is the role that Canada and other international donors play in Uganda? Well, Canada is really a small player in this picture. It's a relatively minor actor in Uganda. But uh, the international community has long been involved in, in Uganda and has played a, a, an on and off role in terms of mobilizing and facilitating uh, the various um, activities of the military. And what we've seen in recent years is that Uganda has really managed to position itself as a key ally of the United States and the international community in fighting international terrorism or fighting violent extremism in the continent. And as the international community and the United States in particular has increasingly come to perceive of Africa as a place where there could potentially be security challenges for United States, for the rest of Africa, and for international stability, they have come to focus more and more on security. And Museveni then, as a former rebel leader with a strong and functional military, has positioned himself as a key ally, keeping in mind, of course, that the United States, Canada, and other Western countries do not themselves want to send their own soldiers for peacekeeping missions in Somalia, South Sudan, the Sahel, because these are now very dangerous missions. So peacekeeping has fallen to African countries, and Uganda has positioned itself as one of the key countries to contribute troops to these very dangerous missions. And henceforth, they have received all this assistance to train, to equip their military and their police forces. And what we saw in this election and what we see over the years is that it is same. It is this same very well-trained, very well-equipped security force that is being deployed on the streets of Kampala to police and oppress legitimate political protest. And Gerald, you wanted to say something? Yes, so um, the, the, I think the challenge for the international community and uh, is President Yoweri Museveni right now has been very, very smart in the way he has uh, sort of uh, categorize the international community as outsiders trying to interfere in the internal processes of Uganda and accusing the opposition of um, corroding with the elements from outside, especially Europe and the USA, to basically hand over the sovereignty of the country. And we have seen that many African dictators, when they are pressed by the international community, they tend to rally their country, their electorates, against external interferences. For example, we saw this in, 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 in Egypt, in, in Zimbabwe, in Rwanda, uh, in Libya. When these dictators are pressed by the international community, they tend to rally the support of the, of the population against what they call as external influence in, in, in the internal processes of their country. But I think for President Yuen Museveni, and I know the EU, for example, has proposed certain sanctions, but the international community has to be very careful in the way they come up with these sanctions so that they don't affect individual civilians on the ground 
at risk that sanctions need to be targeted to top military and political elites who have provi provided, presided over this repression against civilians in Uganda. We only have a few minutes left, but just to go back to what you said, Rita, you said that Canada is a small player. Um, and I think the number is 50 million compared to the US's $1 billion. Um, does Canada need to uh, take more responsibility towards where and how this aid is dispersed, even if, you, as you said, it's small? I think there's a lot for Canada to think about in this. I think there's a lot for it to reconsider in terms of how it positions itself vis-a-vis -vis the broader donor agenda of supporting democracy and human rights and supporting security and stability. Now, Uganda, oh, Canada has always said that its main purpose is to support democracy and human rights. If you go to their website on Canada-Uganda relations, they say we're supporting democracy and human rights and stability and security. Well, this election shows that it's hard to do the two at the same time. And this means that Canada will have to think carefully about other ways in which it can support democracy, not from a position of superiority, not from a position of saying what a country must do, but from a position of solidarity, from a position of supporting. And I think in that sense, Canada being a small country, a middle power, it doesn't have that much influence in the world. But we are at the point in the world where democracy is in decline pretty much everywhere. And most countries have withdrawn from active democracy promotion. For a country like Canada, this is potentially an opportunity to seek ways of building alliances with other middle powers, to find ways of, again, supporting democratic forces at home and abroad. Derek, before we think about uh, moving forward, um, we I wanted to ask you in just one minute if you could give us uh, a quick description of Canada's relationship uh, with Uganda, because it does go back. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fine for political scientists and policymakers to think about what things will look like going forward. But it's worth saying that Canada's connections with Uganda go back a long way. Uh, at the time of Ugandan independence in 1962, Canada provided the first training for Ugandan diplomats at the United Nations. Uganda's new uh, UN ambassador, Apollo Chironde, sat with the Canadian High Commissioner, or the Canadian delegate, rather, uh, in, in New York and was trained on how to do diplomacy with Canadians. Uh, in 1972, Pierre Trudeau welcomed 5,000 expatriated Ugandan Asians to Canada. They were expelled from Idi Amin's Uganda and uh, the Canada was very welcoming to the expatriate community from Uganda. Many of them ended up settling in Toronto. In 1979, Canada helped to furnish the infrastructure for Uganda's first uh, multi-party election uh, in some 18 years. The election of December 1980 was inter underwritten in a large part by Canada's government. So it's worth saying that, well, I think there's much to say about what Canada ought to do going forward. What Rita said earlier about Canada as a kind of middle power, finding allies in unlikely places. For Uganda, as for Canada, there are opportunities to think outside the boxes of superpower rivalries and such to open up other ways of organizing public life. Certainly, that's what the Uganda government has wanted from the 1960s forward. Canada has been a very useful ally. Your book, The Unseen Archive of Idi Amin, comes out soon. What can you tell us about, Amin, about the Amin regime that viewers might be surprised to hear? Idi Amin was followed around by a whole gang of photographers over the course of his nine years in power. Many of their pictures were kept in secret in a, a filing cabinet in the uh, headquarters of Uganda's Ministry of Information. They came to light a few years ago. We've got them digitized, and now we've published them in this book. They're, they're photographs from the inner life of Idi Amin's government that haven't been seen before, and they offer really rich insights into the way that Idi Amin related to his people, the way that the machinery of government worked and into his domestic and personal life as well. Um, you know, when we do think about moving forward, I think the situation in Uganda right now, um, from a security uh, standpoint, the internet was shut down for a month, which meant beyond everything else, if kids were at home, they couldn't even actually study because the internet was shut off. Rita, when you think of the security of Uganda, are you concerned with how the situation is right now? 
I think it's hard not to be concerned. Uh, it's hard not to be concerned about people's day-to-day -day lives uh, on the streets, the bravery of many of the urban youth who've been on the streets protesting. Uh, we read almost daily about kidnappings and further disappearances. So it's hard not to be concerned. I, I think also, though, uh, we often speak about youth as a, as an obstacle and a challenge. And they're looking to the future of Uganda. I think the hope will have to be that there might be a way of mobilizing the energies, the creativity of this urban youth, of the youthful population. You're looking at a country with a median age of 16. Uh, that's a lot of energy. And if that can, if this election can be a spur to think about ways of more inclusive growth, uh, then then the future for Uganda could be a lot more positive than 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 we've seen from the last few weeks and months. Um, Gerald, you know, um, where would you like to see Uganda in five years? I would like to see the the, the country, of course, <laughs> uh, transition to democracy. I, it's my hope, but uh, I don't know uh, what might happen. The future for Uganda is quite very uncertain. In fact. Right now, there is a, a petition in the Supreme Court that is challenging the outcome of the presidential election. And the Supreme Court itself is, of course, highly uh, stoked by uh, judges who are sympathetic or who are to the, to, the, to the current regime. So the hope from the Supreme Court is actually very, very low to many, for, for many Ugandans. So, but at this point, the future of Uganda is very, very uncertain. We even don't know what might ha happen in the case, for example, President Museven, who is now almost uh, over 75 years old in case he drops dead. Right now, the most trained segment of the Ugandan army is controlled by the president's own son, who is now the commander. And there are already talks in the ruling party and uh, inside many um, Ugandan politics that the president is positioning his son to take over power uh, in case anything happened and he's unable to continue ruling the country. And that's all the time we have. Derek, we look forward to your book, which is coming out in March. Gerald, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Kampala and Rita. We appreciate thank all you. of your insights. Thank you so much for making some time for us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.